start the start of the session of the fourth annual conference of Alexandria Fiscal Authority Department under the title of Integrated Laboratory and Clinical Methods. Welcome to all attendees. <coughs> I hope the conference will meet your expectations. I would like to thank the organizing committee for the great effort they have done. Now, starting the first session, the deal with an important subject the diabetes mellitus and complications. The first speaker, Professor Dr. Samir Naim Asar, representing Thailand, I will be the cell presentation and regeneration. I hope every speaker stick to the time and and the discussion will be after the third speech. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, allow me first, uh, on the behalf of the Endocrinology Unit, just to greet uh, the Department of Clinical Pathology uh, for the great effort this time to organize this interesting integrated uh, conference. Uh, and to thank especially Professor uh, uh, Mira Gomisi, the chairman and the rest of the organizer, and Professor Saad Mazouf for inviting me personally. It's a, re it's a great honor. Really. You know that diabetes in our country is, is quite prevalent nowadays, nowadays and, and it's the same all over the world. And uh, you know that uh, in, even in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, there is a problem with the island. So the next... Uh, 14 and a half minutes, I will just deal uh, of the new era. How can we preserve our beta cell and how can we encourage our endogenous beta cell just to, uh, to regenerate again and just to try to avoid what we call the insulin replacement or even the eyelid uh, cell replacement. Uh, first of all, I will just remind you that uh, the eyelids were des described or discovered by uh, uh, Paul Langerhans, uh, he was a student at the University of Berlin, and while being a student, he discovered the, 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 these islands in 1869. And let me remind you that uh, the, the one who discovered insulin was a medical student as well in the University of Toronto. It seems that medical students are very, should be proud of being a medical student, not simply attending lecture. And going back to embryology, you can see that uh, the, the, this are the picture of the ducts of the pancreas and the different branches going to the small branch of the interoperative tubes, and here starts the uh, progenitor for the islet cells. And uh, 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 the, these islet cells, as you can see, there are many cells in the islet, and uh, there are the alpha cells, usually at the surrounding, secreting glucagon, beta cells, green secreting insulin, and uh, the uh, delta cells secreting somatostatin, PP cells secreting uh, uh, bacteria polypeptide, and the most recently discovered is epsilon cells secreting ghrelin, and you know ghrelin stimulates at the time. And uh, they uh, actually they compared the shape of the island to the shape of the brain, and this is very interesting because recently it has been discovered that uh, if you, uh, uh, the, the ground seeds of uh, the grapes are very useful to stimulate insulin. It seems that there is a relation between the grape as a shape and the grape as a function as well. And you can see this is a picture of uh, a photomicrograph of the islet, and what is in green is, uh, are the alpha cells, and in red are the beta cells, and you can see that the alpha cells are in the surrounding, while in the center are the beta cells. And this was, is not haphazard. This was created uh, by uh, God Almighty for a specific purpose, because there is interrelation between uh, the, uh, the different cells. So the alpha cells are controlling the beta cells and the reverse. So please remember that. 
And if you go back to the, the differentiation, as I told you, there is a, uh, a pancreatic primordial coming from the pancreatic ducts, and then we get the endocrine precursor. And there will be two types of lineage, the alpha cell, and this is under the differentiation uh, factor called ARX, and the beta cells and epsilon cell under the stimulating effect of the differentiating factor uh, PAX4. So please remember these because this is the future for either cell regeneration. And if you go back to what happens after the, uh, the, uh, the baby is born, first in the, in the pilot, they start to differentiate into beta at uh, week nine of fetal life. But later on, the beta cell, they continue to replicate and they reach almost, almost the uh, maximum uh, uh, number at the age of 20 years. But it seems that the lifespan of the beta cells is quite long. They don't know actually, but in human it's more than 20 to 30 years. So it seems that the replication of the beta cell is very, very uh, uh, meager. Even in, the, in condition with stress, or like obesity or metabolic stress, the increase in insulin is not actually due to replication. The replication is only 1.2 times normal. The main effect is the increased secretion. So the replication in human, normally speaking, not like animals, the replication of the beta cells is very meager, particularly after the age of 20. And you know this is a famous picture, you get the beta cell apoptosis and the beta cell proliferation, and with age there is more apoptosis and less proliferation. And this is expected because the instance of type 2 diabetes is growing with age. And the beta cell mass depends on the, on the balance between apoptosis, the programmed cell deaths, and the proliferation of the existing mature beta cells, as well as the formation of new beta cells from the progenitor cells. This is the one I'm going to stress is a new formation of from progenitors. I mean, progenitors present, I remember, in the pancreatic cells. This is a normal islet cell. In a normal individual, when patient type 2, you see the number of uh, beta cells is, as expected, is very, very low. And the same occurs in a patient with type 2 diabetes. Uh, sorry for the timing, is covering some of the slides. You can see that the beta cell uh, function in type 2 diabetes this is from a clinical study we call UKBDS. That there is a progressive loss of the beta cell as well. So in both type 1 and type 2, there is a problem with the beta cell. How can we preserve our endogenous beta cell? How can we do that? Let's start with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, there was a trial of, of starting insulin even before the onset of type 1 diabetes and sometimes using immunomodulation. And actually, this was not very, very successful. And recently there was the anti-CD20, the retic and it seems also the results are not very encouraging. But last month, very interesting uh, data from uh, China, as usual, in which they used what we call the stem cell indicator. They brought simply the lymphocytes from type 1 human, this is on human, and they, they injected it through what we call the stem cell indicator line of what they call cord multipotent stem cells. And they injected back this lymphocyte. It seemed that lymphocyte, they change in their behavior. They stop attacking the beta cells. And it seems that they have very good results. As you can see here, uh, this is before uh, the treatment, after the treatment. What is in blue is uh, uh, the pre-oral glucosterone test. What's in orange is the post-oral glucosterone test. And you can see the level of cytotype is going up after this treatment. What about type 2 diabetes? How can we preserve our beta cells? The simplest way is to do lifestyle, is to change from eating this type of food to this type of food. This is a simple way to preserve our beta cell. But if you go to pharma pharmacology, there are different medications are like early insulin use, metformin, uh, GLP-1 analogs or DPP-4 inhibitors or the TCDs. This medication actually they have been shown just to preserve the beta cell, but unfortunately this is not actual preservation because as long as you stop this medication, the beta cell will go back as it, as it used to be. So we need to continue this. This is not final beta cell preservation. The second part of my presentation is how can we regenerate the, our endogenous beta cells without needing the exogenous beta cell, uh, beta islet transplantation or the stem cell. The regeneration of the islets comes from three sources. The proliferation already existing, the neogenesis of new cells 
And the most important, which is the up to date, is what we call the trans differentiation. I mean, reprogramming of cells not secreting insulin to cells secreting insulin, as I will, I will mention in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. The neogenesis, what is evidence here? What is, is there evidence in the human being? Yes, this is uh, published by Carlotti last year, and you can see that this is the pancreatic duct, and what, in, what is there in the arrow is a, a beta cell secreting. Uh, uh, insulin, and this is a new genesis, new genesis from the gut type in human being. So there is evidence that even in adults you can get new genesis. The second part is the proliferation of already existing cells. And there are different material. Some of them are natural, some of them are not. They can be used to stimulate the proliferation of our beta cells. Let's start by some hormone like proactin and growth hormone. You can see this is the uh, Deoxyributyric acid level nuclei as an index of proliferation, and by giving prolactin and growth hormone, you can get a good RNA cell proliferation. And this is very important during pregnancy for the ladies. And the same, the insulin secretions go goes up with the beta cell proliferation after using prolactin and growth hormone. Another interesting is the beta cellulin. Beta cellulin stimulates beta cell regeneration, and also this very useful stimulate the endogenous beta cell generation. Another material, the beta cellulin was, is the epidermal growth factor. This is an endogenous material. The FGF1, the uh, 21, the fibroblast growth factor, also used to preserve the islet and beta cell number. You can see this is the control, and this is giving after the FGF1, there is a good increase in the number of the beta cell after uh, being induced by the FGF1. Uh, mind you that most of these uh, are done in experimental animals, like this was done in DB, DB mice. Very interesting is the GLP-1. Here, believe me, before this uh, uh, nauseous things, there is a GLP-1. This is GLP-1, as you remember, coming from the gut, and this stimulates the proliferation of insulin. Insulin is in green, and the TI-67, key, key as you all know, because we have a variety of personnel, this is an index for proliferation of cells, and you can, after giving GLP-1, this is before GLP-1, and this is after GLP-1, and there is proliferation of insulin secreting cells. So GLP-1 is very important. Even inhibiting the enzyme called DPP-4, which breaks down the GLP-1, like using Vildagleptin, one of the older DPP-4, you can see that it stimulates also the proliferation. The proliferation of the beta cells it diminishes the cell death, and at the end of the day, the beta cell man goes up. Very interesting, it's another material called ginsulcide is also stimulating the transcription factor. And more recently, the recently anti-angina drug called uh, ranolazine. This anti-angina drug was discovered to uh, stimulate the beta cell survival and regeneration, improving glucose in most stages in low dose in mice. And lastly, Chinese plant, usually going back to China, so everything now is China is doing great effort, the, the Israel Sinclair is secreting uh, what we call uh, the FTY720, uh, and you see that in mice, again, this is uh, before treatment of this, and this is after treatment, there is a good replication of the beta cells. The last part of my talk in the next three minutes is about what we call trans-differentiation. Trans-differentiation means reprogramming of the non-insulin secreting cells to insulin cells. And the most important is the alpha cell. You remember the alpha cell is secreting glucagon. Can we change alpha cells from being a glucagon secreting to insulin secreting? Let's see the data. In, in type 1 diabetes and in induced type 1 diabetes by streptostocin in animal, you can see that the alpha cell number goes up. So there is a replication of the alpha cells in type 1. And this also occurred in patients with type 2 that the number of alpha cells after induction, you can see the number cell of, uh, this is the number of alpha cell in black, it, in diabetes it goes, goes up, while beta cell goes down. So it seems that in both type 1 and type 2, there is alpha cell replication. And uh, in clinically speaking, we find, as a clinician, we find the glucagon level is high in patients with type 2. That's why the DPP-4 inhibitor and the GLP-1 are useful for us clinicians to control diabetes. Let's see the data on animals. These are the beta cells before streptotocin, full of, uh, of islet beta, beta cells. And after giving streptotocin, the number of beta cells in, uh, in brown is very, very meager. 
And uh, what the alpha cells before cytosine, before induction of, of diabetes, the uh, number is very low. While the number here is getting bigger after induction of the, uh, diabetes. Means again, there is replication of the alpha cell. We find that in this uh, animal model, this is the, uh, the blue are the cell secreting insulin, and in the uh, brown or yellow, the alpha cell glucagon secreting. When you induce by diphtheria toxin, you destroy the alpha and the beta cell, the alpha cells are still there, and can we change the alpha cells? Can they change behavior? Let's see some data on very interesting uh, uh, study paper uh, published in Nature, you know, it's a very respectable journal, and you can see that uh, uh, what we call alpha to beta pre program. Let's see, insulin is in red, glucagon is in purple, and YFP is an index of the alpha cells is in green. And this is, uh, you can see that the, the number of glucose secreting cells is, is very low. While after inducing diabetes by uh, giving uh, the, the, the diphtheria toxin, you can see that the, 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 the purple cells, the purple cells are growing in patients, in the animals. While very interesting, you can see this is the insulin in, in red, while uh, the purple is glucagon. They are changing behavior, so is this is the same cell changing behavior from insulin secreting to beta secreting after giving the differentiation factor. What type of differentiation factor? From the ARX stimulating alpha, so you don't need that. Actually, you need the PAX4 to stimulate these cells to change their behavior. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me uh, conclude, but there is always a uh, future for new uh, era in peace, treating patients with diabetes. And this is a very nice picture from the old port of Alexandria. This is uh, during the sunrise, and we invite all the guests to Alexandria to visit this place. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
increase the blood glucose leads to excess insulin secretion, which will lead by the, by the end to pancreas exhaustion. By the end results, we will be with increasing the second type of diabetes to type 2 diabetes. Different cells respond differently to insulin uh, different, different cells respond differently to the insulin resistance. For example, liver cells become first resistant, followed by muscle tissues and lastly fat cells. This is why when we think of in, in, in addition to this insulin resistance, when we find the fat levels or fat contents of his blood very high or disturbed too much, this means this, that this patient is going to change from insulin resistance to type 2 diabetes. The damn symptoms that may lead to diagnosis of suspicion of insulin resistance include fatigue, which is the most common feature of insulin resistance. Also, there is brain fogging in the form of inability to focus, poor memory, loss of creativity, poor grades in school, and various forms of learning disabilities. There is also intestinal bloating from the undigested carbohydrates in the intestine, together with the sleepiness, especially after meat. One of the most important manifestations is weight gain, fat storage, and difficulty in losing weight. The fat in insulin resistance is generally stored in and around the abdominal organs in both females and the females, that is, the western distribution. It is currently suspected that hormone production produced in these fat tissues are, are precipitating causes for this for the induction of this insulin resistance. Also, we have lastly increased hunger and depression due to the deranged metabolism. The science of, of this insulin resistance is mainly uh, laboratory in the form of high blood glucose, hypertrichosemia, increased pro-inflammatory cytokines associated with cardiovascular diseases, as well as acanthosis negricans, which is just uh, black coloration in the lower part of the neck, especially in the back. Some uh, many physicians consider this as a diagnostic uh, manifestation for insulin resistance. As the cause of insulin resistance, this, this condition is multifactorial, of course. In addition to the hereditary genetic disorders precipitating this, uh, this uh, disorder, we can also blame first diet. Diet containing high fat content plus deficiency in omega-3 plus overeating will lead by the end to insulin resistance and to type 2 diabetes. All of these three parameters are found, are found in the fast food. And the disconnection of these fast foods is the main cause to overeating and insulin resistance. Also, high proteins leads to blood acidity and excess uric acid. Blood acidity and uric acid by themselves are believed to be, to be precipitating factors for insulin resistance. And recently, the low vitamin D in diet and in the, our plasma are considered also as cause of insulin resistance. Many drugs are known to affect the resistance of tissues to insulin action. Of course, we know cortisol, we can be seen, isoninazide, progesterone, and many other drugs. Recently, glucosamines are considered now as a very high risk factor. Glucosamines are uh, drugs widely prescribed for joint disorders in order to increase the synovial fluid production. Okay. This gives good results, okay, but it will lead to insulin resistance. And this, this should not be the case after that. It should not be taken freely. Okay. And this glucosamine should take the red card to go out of our life. Third is sedentary life. And we should remember the uh, very famous statements that say that vigorous exercise at least once a week will reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes by 33%. This is also applicable to insulin resistance. Recently, we 
are facing is that virus C infection is one of the leading factors for this insulin resistance. This increases the risk of type 2 diabetes by 2 to 3, uh, two, three times of, 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 in general population. This also causes this manifestation of type 2 to appear very early at age between 20 or 30 or 40 years instead of 50 or 60 years as usual. This is mainly due to the viral proteins themselves and the cytokines produced in uh, the inflammatory cells of hepatocytes that will hinder the insulin pathway, or its insulin signaling pathway leading to insulin resistance. So we are facing we are facing the problem in our country here. We are facing the problem of widespread of HCV together that will lead to the widespread of insulin resistance and the type 2 diabetes. The cellular mechanism of this insulin resistance is in the form of, 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 of due to the accumulation of triglycerides and its products inside the cytoplasm of the cells will lead to hindering the action of the protein kinase enzyme that is essential for activation of insulin response substrate that is responsible for induction of the cellular response of insulin. Also, the, by the diet on the long run will change or increase the unsaturated phospholipids uh, inside the cell membrane over the unsaturated fatty phospholipids, this increase in this ratio will destroy or replace the insulin receptors and reduce insulin. <coughs> now, check to the diagnosis of insulin receptors. <coughs> First, fasting insulin level, which is, of course, fasting insulin level, uh, level, which, of course, is a preemptive test. Not everyone having increased the insulin means he has insulin resistance. And glucose tolerance test, which is also lacking sensitivity and specificity. The high one insulinemic glycemic lamp is the gold standard method for this for this diagnosis. But of course, this is not a clinical application. This is just a research work. And it is true. And its name is due to infusion of how it measures the amount of glucose injected needed to compensate for the increased amount of insulin injected in order to keep the blood, the blood, the blood level of glucose constant without going to hypoglycemia. Without details of the test, we, we, we measure the amount needed to, of glucose to compensate for this infused insulin and when in order to keep the blood level of between 90 and 100 milligram, and the blood glucose should be measured every five minutes within the two hours of the test. If we find that only a very small amount of glucose is needed to keep this glucose level constant, this means that this patient is insulin resistant, and the insulin does not act <coughs> to get rid of the infused glucose. To simplify this uh, complicated technique, there is a modified insulin suppression test which, in which we suppress the endogenous secretion of glucose and the insulin by, uh, by sandostatin and stomatostatin and infuse also glucose and insulin in uh, special rates and we measure the amount uh, at the end of glucose infusion. We measure the glucose level by 120, 130, and 140, and 150 minutes at the end of the test, get the average. If this glucose level is found to be very high, this means the patient has insulin resistance. The most practical test we have now in our hands is homeostatic model assessment, which is HOMA insulin resistance. This avoids complicated nature of the clamping techniques and the potential danger of hypoglycemia in some patients. This is simple technique, practical, correlates well, correlate well with the clamping methods. We are just simply measuring fasting insulin, fasting glucose, and apply the equation insulin, fasting insulin times fasting glucose in millimole per liter divided 22.5, we get the HOMA IR. 
In order to change the formula to a milligram per deciliter, we, we apply it fasting insulin times fasting glucose in milligram per deciliter divided by 405. The normal level is below 2.5, and the insulin resistance is diagnosed when the uh, result is more than 4.5. I was lucky to, uh, to share in many uh, researches in, uh, concerning the insulin resistance. The first one was, was the concerning the metabolic, metabolic syndrome, which was seven years ago in the MPTC of one of my dear colleagues, Dr. Turanovach, yet. And we evaluated the insulin, uh, the medication associated with insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome. This metabolic syndrome was, by this time, was a blow up the resolution, blow up of researches for setting this metabolic syndrome, which consisted of increased fasting blood glucose and high blood pressure, regular size over 150, HDL low, lower than 40 in, in May and lower than 50 in May. In, in, in and uh, with circumference is more than 1 to 102 and 88 centimeters in May. In May. This syndrome is now, there is a great debate if it is exist or just, is just uh, manifestation of insulin resistance. And we concluded that the mutation in insulin receptor Substance, substrate 1 and the tissue cross factor beta 1 gene associates with the obesity and insulin resistance and they may as well increase the risk of cardiovascular disease in metabolic syndrome patients. The second uh, research was concerning the polycystic ovaries and we concluded that all studied fertile females with coma IR more than 7 they actually had polycystic ovary and it considered as a diagnostic test. The third one was about heart disease and we concluded that HOMI-R is an independent predictor of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes uh, mellitus and correlated to the number and severity of the attacks. The higher the HOMI-R, the higher the incidence of the cardiovascular attacks and the, the more severe uh, is the manifestation of these attacks. The last one <coughs> is the liver, and we said a few slides ago that uh, HCV is a precipitating cause to insulin resistance. Now we can say that insulin resistance favors the, the fibrosis progression in HCV because hyperinsulinemia directly activates uh, steroid cells and increases connective tissue growth factor. And in this accelerated fibrosis, we end by osteogenesis paralysis. In our research, we found that HOMA-IR is closely correlated with the presence of osteogenesis paralysis and its degree in HCV patients. And also, HOMA-IR can predict the presence of osteogenesis paralysis in early childhood class A patients to avoid unnecessary endoscopy. That is to say, if we have very early manifestation of uh, fibrosis in, in, in HCV patients, and we measure HOMA IR. When we find it it's very low, this means that these patients almost have no a large degree of fibrosis and no large degree of vestibular paralysis, and we can avoid the unnecessary endoscopy. In summary, we can from these researches we can say that insulin resistance affects the whole body activities, for example, including metabolism, fertility, heart, and liver, and many other organs. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Salah Mandou, for your elegant presentation. And now, we pass to the next speaker. First of all, I like Thank you.
Thank you, teacher. I'm 
already out uh, some of the books. Charge ratio of 6,028 was promptly released from the urine 
should feed the property only and not all, in all the other groups. The mass peaks were identified as beta 2 pi block. Here you can see this protein. Only present in the patient with the protein and not in all other groups. Verification of the protein analysis data was achieved by Western block analysis. Another step uh, was used for the identification also of potomic uh, uh, biomarkers in the identity property, and, this, and here we used two differential gel, uh, two dimensional different gel electrophoresis. Uh, uh, the list of the technique is used of fluorescent cyanine dyes, which possess this distinct excitation and emission spectrum. These dyes differentially label two protein samples for comparative analysis of patient and control sample on one gel. Uh, here the spots are climbed in red were consistently 1.5 fold upregulated and the spots are climbed in green were consistently 1.5 fold downregulated in diabetes with macroalbuminia compared to diabetic patients without macro without albumin. Individual spots were kept uh, from the gel, this same and the gel was restricted. Protein identification was obtained by liquid chromatography tandem methodology. Comparison between control and diabetic subjects with different stages of renal dysfunction revealed the differential expression of several proteins. Several proteins that were supposed to be upregulated with feeding albuminia and two proteins uh, downregulated. And here are the list of the proteins. Uh, <coughs> We have ample rooms for topics for future investigation for this type of research, whether biomarkers of issues, biomarkers of spontaneous regression, and biomarkers of regression under therapy, and biomarkers of progression. Many scientists are working on this. Uh, I speak rapidly uh, on future research in type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is thought to be an open of the data.
high levels of glucose were extremely reliable with an estimated 100% reliability if more than 200 milligram. It is uh, easy to be alive. So we have numerous factors that may contribute to this lack of reversibility, either biological or pre-analytical variation. The biological factors, it is intra-individual variation in healthy person is reported to be from 5.7 to 8.3 percent, whereas intra-individual person and other person variation up to 12.5 percent has been observed. <clears throat> and based on uh, coefficient of variation of 5.7 percent, fasting blood uh, fasting plasma glucose can range from 112 to 140. So 126 uh, is not respected in this way. We have different and other factors pre analytical. The effect of medications, uh, venous thesis, the posture of the patient, sample handling, food ingestion, prolonged fasting, exercise, intercurrent illness, acute stress, the patient come to the lab and do not find uh, a parking for his car and he will be upset. All this can affect the result of the glucose. And overnight fast is very important. The requirements that the subject is to be fasting is a considerable and practical problem. Fasting blood glucose was performed on only 3% volunteers all of them are medicals, but only 3% come fasting on the second day when they ask it to come fasting. Uh, it is a problem to uh, get uh, fasting. Analysis, diurnal variation, analysis of 12,882 participants aged 12, 20 years uh, considerably have higher uh, fasting blood glucose in the morning than in the afternoon. Uh, so, prevalence of diabetes in afternoon was half than that of participants, of participants examined in the morning. It's another factor can affect the level of glucose. And also, glucose concentration in the test tube. What is the effect of glycolysis? And all of us know this. If we left the sample, 5 to 7 percent decrease will occur in uh, our test. And what about the, the, the anti-glycolytic anti, uh, effect of sodium chloride? It acts after two hours. For the first two hours, cannot act. So glycolysis is continuous, uh, but it continues for 72 hours. Also, the effect of acidification in blood glucose, which is very, very good, but it is not practical. And uh, placing the tubes on ice also is not practical. And separation cells from plasma within minutes for every test, if you have many, many cases, it is also impractical. The nature of the specimen itself, if it is uh, serum, plasma, or whole blood, because as we know that the content of glucose in the red blood cells about 70% that in the plasma. Uh, the source of blood, is it capillary or venous blood, also has an effect. Now come to the analytical variation. The analytical variability is about 2 to 1. 2.5% uh, is considerably less than that of the biological variability. And the accuracy of measurement remains a problem. There is no program to standardize results among different instruments and different laboratories. Uh, glucose measurement by oral glucose tolerance test, it has a, a, a good advantage that it is sensitive indicator of risk uh, of the of development of diabetes, and it is early marker of impaired glucose uh, homeostasis, but it has also many disadvantages. Lacks reversibility, uh, extensive patient preparation needed, time consuming and inconvenient for patients, unpalatable, expensive, errors by numerous medications subject to the same limitations as fasting blood. So, what we are looking for if we are going to measure hemoglobin A1C? And as you see here, this is hemoglobin A coming from the red cell, and hemoglobin F less than 1%, and hemoglobin A2 
which is less than 3.5 percent of hemoglobin E, as you see, uh, contains hemoglobin E0 and E1. And E1 is composed of A1E, A1B, and A1C. And we are after A1C, which constitute about 4 uh, to 6 percent of glucose content. So, what occurs if the blood in contact with glucose? There is non enzymatic glycation of hemoglobin A. And this leads to the formation of labile hemoglobin A, 1C, as you see. Uh, unstable reverse for the action between glucose and the N-terminal valine of the beta chain, and this is turned to, uh, to a stable hemoglobin A1C later on. The labile A1C is formed with the unstable adapt of glucose to the N-terminal amino group of the global chain of hemoglobin is here. There is a biological relation and this labile, as we said before, tends to be a stable part. So the advantage of A1C measurement is subject need to not to be fast, as all we know. Samples may be obtained at any time of the day. We can measure at any time. And very little biological variability. And sample is stable for one week <coughs> and not altered by acute factors. Like this. Or exercise. <coughs> we have another also advantage. It reflects long term blood glucose concentration. A C is standardized across instruments. Accuracy of the test is monitored. Single sample, namely whole blood, concentration predicts the development of microvascular complications of diabetes and used to guide treatment. And lowering A1C concentration significantly reduces the rate of progression of microvascular complications. But we have also disadvantages in A1C may be altered by factors other than glucose, change of the resource lifespan, and patients with hemolytic disease or other conditions with shortened A resource survival have a substantial reduction in A1C. And false increases in A1C have been reported with some methods in patients with hypertrichosidemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and may not be available in some laboratories and also it is expensive. So the reason hemoglobin A1C was not accepted as a diagnostic criteria by diabetes by clinicians were mainly the imposition of the assay in various laboratories and questions about sensitivity. This is a problem of clinicians. And we have to solve these problems before we have in the lab. Usually we use in the lab immunoassay technique and this is not a good method uh, because uh, we have many problems with this uh, assay. Some uh, it can interfere with that measurement. And as we know that immunoassay can uh, act with this amino acid, just only this amino acid. So if we are going to measure the A1C in this amount, we can measure another, uh, another uh, thing that can over increase the level of A1C. Uh, we can uh, measure capability development in the spikes of A1C. And also, uh, this uh, will be very serious if the mission has kidney dysfunction. And also, we can measure as dilated hemoglobin, in spite of, of A1C in an adult, there will be increase in A1C in these cases and those who are using uh, aspirin. And so the levels by this technique overestimate the loss of A1C. 
Fit remodeling is somewhat a uh, problem with uh, measuring A1C in some uh, lessons using uh, chromatography. So we have uh, individuals with iron deficiency anemia also have increased A1C concentration identified by the demonstration that vanadite diet, which is increased in subject with iron deficiency anemia, augments the glycation of remodeling. IFCC developed capillary or mass spintometry, which are a very a complex technique and very unroutine to assess the A1C. And we have different methods other than immunoassays, which depend on chromatography. These are good, but we have different companies. And what is the best of them? It is according to the patient itself, if the patient has uh, hemoglobin C or hemoglobin S or, or hemoglobin E or hemoglobin T, we have to select the patient. So we have in hemoglobin A1C some uh, with and some without uh, advantages, and we have to select our method according to their case. So I come back a comprehension of the fact that everyone's A1C values and the conditions where it should not be used will produce accurate and clinically meaningful results. The convenience of sampling at any time without regard to, without regard to food ingestion makes it likely that measures of A1C will result in the detection of many of the millions of people with diabetes who are currently undiagnosed. Thank you. And the glycated hemoglobin 
at the end terminal valley, that is A1C, and this now also took over by the ICC definition. Not so nice picture as from the professor, but also here to say we have a very quick uh, reaction with glucose with the n terminal part, but it's going away. So it's quite important that we do not measure the label fraction because you don't say anything. We have to measure our stable A1C. The production of A1C is depending on the concentration of the glucose in one thing but also the time that the glucose is high. So A1C is the combination of concentration and time. So half concentration at quite long time will have the same effect than high concentration over a short time. Quite important is that one hemoglobin is glucated, stable A1C, it will stay in the red blood cell till the red blood cell is gone away. And we normally say in about three months. So A1C will see, give us an indication of the glucose over the past two to three months. So here we have publication about the mean A1C and here the mean glucose volume. There is a correlation, quite a big spread, but maybe it's also due to the measurement of the glucose that is not always that accurate. Talk about the follow-up. We have to go to two studies, one in the US, DCCT, and one in the UK, UK PDS study. And both studies came to the conclusion, if we treat our patient decently, the A1C is lower, and the lower A1C gives the reduction of the complication. So here it's reduction. 75% reduction of renopathy, so less people get blind. 35% reduction of cardiovascular risk. And from this study, our 7% is gone. They have seen that the best benefits you have if you get the A1C below the 7%. The screening, they have targeted or diagnosis 6.5%. Above 6.5%, the risk of diabetes is high. When a person has diabetics, the best is go to the 7%. Also, to be careful, if you over-treat, then you've got all the consequences for your patient. He will be fed. Just imagine he's driving a car. He got him fed, and then he's also dead. So the uh, hippo, at least we, we also have to avoid in diabetic patients. So what we can say, so glycated hemoglobin, powered full two in evaluation management of diabetic patients. We can use it for the screening and the diagnosis. Click at hemoglobin, long-term glycemic control, and it's in correlation with the consequence. But when we measure glycated hemoglobin, it must be reflect the average glucose value over the last three months. I start my talk to say, click at hemoglobin, give an idea about glycemic over the last three months, but it's not always the case. So we can have problems. First is the analytical problem. So calibration, so meaning when your test is wrongly calibrated, you can, are not correlated to international studies. So you cannot use the cutoff of 7%. Okay. You can say it's a problem of the manufacturers, and then I can say you're right. The only thing that happens to do is to control their test with decent external quality control protocols that they are in line with international studies. <coughs> the imprecision, what I say. So the variation of A1C must reflect the variation of glucose in the patient sample and not the measurement. Okay. Normally patients are follow up after three months. So if you have a difference in A1C, it may not be due to the test, to the measurement, but it has really to reflect the glucose. Interference with other hemoglobins, label of A1C. We have the carbohydrate in C, with kidney patients, and we have the acid 
uh, yeah, one thing, reaction with alcohol derivatives. Uh, in these countries less frequently, uh, but you also have uh, aspirin, but also some alcohol derivatives that pro uh, your body make can interfere with your hemoglobin. And that interference with medication, and at this moment I can say, luckily at this moment we didn't have seen it, that certain medication, just imagine for a headache, will react with hemoglobin and will interfere with the test. So at this moment, known medication, known interfere in this way. Interference with other hemoglobin variants, I will go further on that. So the A1C value obtained is not correct in these cases. So meaning your treatment will be not correct because you have no value. The other problem, it's more critical, it's a clinical problem. So we can have interference with medication. And here we have medication now. For instance, medication for HIV treatment will make a bigger turnover of the red blood cells. So the red blood cells will not leave three months, but only, let's say, two months and a half. So the A1C value is not the mean value of three months, but only the mean value of 2.5. And that's also a big influence. Moreover, I have to start, tell you that the glycation rate of the red blood cells is in the beginning of the life slow and it's quicker at the end of the life. Because the cell getting older, glucose can enter easily in the cell. So really meaning that losing a few days of red blood cell life have a big consequence in A1C concentration. Which you, on your paper of your lab, you will, you will not notice. Hemoglobin variant. So if uh, you have a variant of hemoglobin, this is also, of course, glycated. Nobody knows which is the glycation rate. No study has done with diabetic patients with uh, hemoglobin S, which target value we have to use then. Another thing is that most of the variants will reduce red blood cell life. So when you have an hemoglobin variant, the A1C value of 7% we cannot use due to the lack of red blood cells. Hemoglobin F elevation, again, the same thing, hemoglobin F is different glycated and also can also be an indication of red cell life difference. And then, all hematological disease. Just think about anemic person or person after car accident it will produce a lot of fresh blood, a lot of fresh red blood cells. Fresh red blood cells have A1C of 0%, which go to a uh, total down. So here, in this problems, our glycated hemoglobin value is correct. But even then, it can lead to a false treatment. So, what are now the solutions for a follow-up for a patient? Report A1C. Also, I've seen guidelines is to report A1C and not to total glycated hemoglobin. So, a little bit what Professor Lisk said. Here we have our hemoglobin A molecule. If you look at the normal person, we have hemoglobin, hemoglobin F, normally lower than 2%, A2, 3.5%. It's the A2 that is going up with the bad thalassemia disease. We have the A, 90% stay normal, it's modif uh, 6% is modified, A1A, A1B, and here we have our A1C. And if you look carefully, A1A can also be split into other fragments. So we have to measure A1C. Look for a test with an extreme low CV because as the intra CV of A1C is quite low, so it's quite important that you can measure your test with a low CV. No interference with the label carbamylated acetylated fraction, no interference with the hemoglobin variance. So, if we measure A1C, the value obtained must reflect long-term glucose. And then, most important is, 
where that's not possible due to the patient that you know it. That you know my A1C value for that patient don't reflect the studies. I have to treat that patient differently. I have to report the result differently to the diabetologist that he can look for the best treatment. Most of them became kidney patients 
in high urea in their blood with the production of high carbon dating fraction. So here we have the normal patient, and this is high carbonated fraction. This is done in the lab artificially by incubation of the blood at high temperature with urea. You see, the 7% move a little bit to 7.3%, but here now we have a carbonated fraction of 12%. Normally that patient will not be alive anymore due to the kidney problems. But you see, no interference of the carbonated fraction. So the label fraction, so incubation with uh, the glucose, uh, we will see that the label fraction is going up, while the stable fraction stays nicely in the same. So here, label fraction for 1.5 to nearly 10, stable fraction 5.3, 5.4%. So the no interference with the common variants, how the system can to that, how the system will calculate, it will take the area from stable A1C, uh, nearly 40 here, divided by the total area multiplied by 100, and then put in the calibration equation form. Okay. What happens now with the presence of the variant, the system will take the area of the variant out of the total area. So what the system will calculate is just a stable A1C, or the stable clicked A fraction divided by all the total A fraction. Okay. So the A1C is the clicked A divided by the total A. And not the clicked total A will be divided by the total A. Other thing is if you use this kind of technology, is that you got at the same time an identification of the variants. So here we have hemoglobin as detected, which is the most frequent in this area. And the A1C value is corrected. The same thing here an example for hemoglobin D, hemoglobin C. All the other variants present will be detected as an extra peak, but the system will not identify it. Elimination of the hemoglobin F, here the same. If the hemoglobin F is too high, the hemoglobin F will be subtracted from the total area. So that means that with hemoglobin F fractions higher till 22%, the system will give the correct A1C percent. Moreover, the system will give you error flag when the hemoglobin is higher than 2 because then you can look, did the person don't have hematological disease, why is this hemoglobin is F is getting up? About the imprecision, so mostly the system is working with the CD lower than 2%. And here you have the capsule bag, and here you see APLC methods, and here you will see the APLC methods. And this is the CV between 300 laboratories all over the world, a capsule lab. So it's not the CV of one lab, but the CV of all the users of this methodology. So that here, you see they are even walking worldwide with the CV around 1.5%. So meaning, if I'm testing my blood here in Alexandria, and in three months' time in New York, the result will be the same in condition that my glucose will stay. And while here you have the other immunological metals with an extremely high person CV. So the two blue lines are the limits acceptable by the car. So if I go back to my time, it's not the only way, but the way to do a decent follow up of your diabetic patients. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mario, for your elegant presentation. And now the session is open for discussion. Yes, Professor Samir.
us, the dermatologist, uh, the patient with the glucose going up and down. I mean, going from glucose, uh, from glucose to 40, 30, and then the next uh, two hours is 300. Usually they get from glucose you want to see like the normal person. And then in way, my laboratory has apart from the continuous glucose monitor, just to detect this with variation in the glucose in the blood glucose. The good thing, and then of course, if you want to measure that, the bad thing about A1C is that it really gives you an indication of the long term. So if you, let's say, you want to infuse with glucose during 24 hours, the next day your A1C will be still the same. So I think to have high A1C artificially, you need to have an infuse with uh, glucose, let's say, for one week, and then you will see that it's going up. It's really something uh, low, but that's not quite good for, let's say, for the treatment, that you have a real uh, idea how low the glucose was over a long period, and then also about the screening, because these people, mostly diabetic people, are too high with the glucose during a long time, which the elevation of the Again, so uh, What about this situation? Patient with hepatic and renal pain, is it dependent? Uh, so, as long as the disease do, do not affect the hematology, that means that uh, red blood cell production is normal and red blood cell breakdown is normal, then these two diseases do not influence. So, for uh, kidney disease, it's quite clear. It, uh, the urea will not affect the A1C value, it will be stable. For hepatologic diseases like uh, triglycerides, uh, it's not interfered because it's even not going in the reaction. Because you are measuring a nice red color out of your color, uh, the fat will not affect your separation. The only thing if you have only this kind of samples, that you have to replace your column quicker and clean your instrument more. But as, as a laboratory. And for three? For three minutes is yes. Is it dependent? No. The, the value you can trust. Okay. Uh, I understood from your uh, lecture that in clinical organs, the A1C is not always easy to, uh, to estimate and to depend upon. Am, am I, am I correct? Yeah, you are correct. So, so for, for instance, A1C, a woman who gives birth to a child, with A1C you can do nothing the next three months. It has no meaning anymore. Also, distant operations, that kind of things, a look, uh, high loss of blood. Also, anemic patients, and especially anemic patients who start the treatment can produce a lot of new red blood cells. At that moment, A1C has no meaning. And the good thing is because most of the lab are not aware about these things, that the system give an indication that there's something wrong. That you say, okay, this is the A1C, because uh, I've not told you, uh, I've seen patients and then said to me with an A1C of 2.5%. Then you say, okay, it's not possible. And then they say, yes, but she just gave birth to a child, lost a lot of blood, and then the told you. Under, so under these circumstances, estimation of blood report is more dependable. Yeah, in, in, in that short period, the only thing that we can rely on is uh, the fructose. Also, the fructose amine can be used as alternative. Uh, and fructose amine, uh, with red blood cell distribution, can use fructose amine. Okay, with a lot of lost blood, and not lost also not, because then it's also uh, modified. Uh, but fructose amine gives you an idea about uh, one month period. You can compare with the A1C that gives you three months. So for a good follow-up on a stable type of patient, that's the best. But all your locations you have to find uh, other ways. Any other question? Some of the patients may be developed in India. 
but even I will commit my prosthetic or non prosthetic and many of them may require blood transfusion. So blood transfusion itself is going to affect the result of H1C. Yeah. So blood transfusion will completely ruin uh, your picture. Uh, moreover, it's like that, that uh, depending on how the blood is collected, uh, sometimes the blood bag also glucose is added, for the, and then the, blood, the patient received has a higher concentration of stable AMC. So there you also have to be careful uh, about, because blood transfusion, right, waiting three months and then you can measure again. So if something happens with the blood, AMC has completely no meaning. Also very careful, I think if it's introduced for screening or diagnosis, that you also have to ask to your patient, okay, uh, and also measure the other parameters uh, like ferritin, uh, maybe B12 folate to see, or homocysteine, to see that the blood is really stable, otherwise there's no meaning. And the most important thing is that, what I want to tell is with variants and all things, that you know what you measure. Because always if you have a value, you send out and it can be dangerous for the patient. Diabetes, like a diagnosed pre-diabetes, it is 
fasting, God will oppose is more than 100, but less than 126, less than 126. This is the fast. And the post girl from 140 to 199 is periodized. So this is the clinical uh, diagnosis of periodized. Can rely upon and can depend upon these methods. Yes? And sometimes you, in the same patient you find the post that is normal. And fasting is? Uh, the fasting is more than one hundred. Yes. He is the pre-diabetic. Regardless of the post -diabetic. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask Professor Mustafa Rez about why blood glucose is more in the afternoon than in the morning. There is the effect of hormones, uh, but it, it, it is uh, confirmed by research that there is a difference between fasting and afternoon levels. So it is better to uh, to get our results usual in the morning because the patient comes sometimes and want to do postprandial or fasting at uh, starting at 2 p.m. and postprandial at 4 p.m. And usually we, we, we get uh, not good results, usually. I'm asking about the explanation. Why? Ah, I think that uh, there is a hormonal effect variation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Ah, stress, 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 exercise, stress many, many, many factors. And now we are in stress. <laughs> Mustafa said about the variation in fasting uh, uh, glucose and the afternoon glucose, maybe a morning glucose and the afternoon glucose, maybe due to a hormonal effect, especially uh, the cortisone, because it has a very close uh, link to the glucose metabolism in the body and its physiological variation.